and all the two. Madonna Conqueror, that's who I am. I shall arise and now shine for the glory, for the glory of the Lord. Beyond the north, beyond the north, yeah. beyond my feet, beyond the natural. I will still I shall arise beyond the sky. By the power, by the power of the Lord, beyond the limits, beyond the limits, sing it, beyond the numbers, yeah, beyond the ordinary, beyond the truth. He's God before us. Who can stand against us? Stand against us. We have the victory through Christ alone. Come on, I am blessed. You know the team. Might be broken. But I'm still alive. Still alive. Come on. Satisfied. Yeah. I'm pressing on towards the prize. Beyond, beyond. Beyond the north. Sing it. Beyond my queen. Yeah, yeah. Beyond the natural. Come on. I will ascend. Yeah. I'm sorry, high. Beyond the sky. Push it, push it, come on. Yeah. We can stand against us. Yeah. We have the victory. To pass the Lord. Now let's do this greater. Greater is he that is in me. Say. That he that is in the world. So I can do it. I can do it. I can do it. I can do all things. Yeah. We sing beyond the norm, say. Starting a series, I trust that it's going to be a three part series and it's going to be talking about men on divine assignment. I know there's a lot of um, controversy in these last days about false apostles and about men that God has sent. And I trust that this series will bring us to an awakening and an awareness that there are still men of God and people that God sends into our generation. And so let's all be um, pay heed and, and learn and, and be able to discern when God is doing something in our lives and God has sent somebody in our lives to help us. Amen. Turn your Bible with me to the book of John chapter 1. I'm reading verse 6. John chapter 1, verse number 6. It says, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. Let's all read it together. One, two, go. 
there was a man sent from God whose name was John. So there are people in every generation, I believe, who are on divine assignment and errands. Um, we are talking about a person who has been separated unto God and lives for God. This series will help you identify and link up with men of God for access into a glorious future. I trust that God is sending people to help you and you must not miss your visitation in Jesus' name. Amen. And one of the things also is you must be able to discern and avoid counterfeit also. And by the help of the Holy Ghost, I trust that this word and this series will bring understanding and open our eyes to the people God sends. In John chapter 1, reading from verse 10, we see a very interesting narration. It says that he was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So you can see how a generation missed the greatest visitation of their lives because they couldn't discern that God had sent somebody to help them. He came into the world. He actually descended from heaven, came among his own people, a world that he himself had made, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. So it is important for you to understand that people have made mistakes in the past. God himself descended and came to live among them. They didn't discern him. They didn't know him. And those who knew him decided that we won't receive him. May God help us to avoid this mistake and to be able to receive everything he has for us in our generation. May God open our eyes to discern the people he sends and to receive them into our lives in Jesus' name. Somebody say amen. amen. So we are going to start by looking at a first encounter of Abraham who is the father of our faith with a godly priest named Melchizedek and some of the lessons we can glean from this encounter to help us receive men and women of God. Genesis chapter 14. I'm reading from verse 18 to 20. It says, And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. 19. And he blessed Abraham and said, Blessed be Abraham of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be the Most High God, which has blessed, which has delivered thine enemies into thy hand. And he gave him tithes of all. Let's do a bit of a background. In obedience to God, Abraham started a journey accompanied by his wife and his nephew Lot, who reared livestock with him. As they prospered, their headsmen began to quarrel, and this reveals a character trait of Abraham. He's not a greedy person. And so he tells Lot, let us not quarrel. We are relatives. There's plenty of land available. And Abraham lets Lot choose. Who promptly chooses the very fertile and well-watered land near Sodom and Gomorrah. Later, there is a war and Lot is captured. Abraham is not vindictive. He still takes 318 trained men in his house and goes to battle against five kings and recovers everything and he sets Lot free. He brings back all the goods and all the women and the people. The goods include a very wide array of items from gold, silver, military weapons, cattle, supplies, baggage, utensils, etc. Everything you gave from the battle was yours to keep. This made Abraham instantly very rich because he had gone to battle. But in Genesis chapter 14 verse 16, it says that Abraham brought back all the goods and also brought again his brother Lot and his goods and the women also and the people. As Abraham returns, he is met and congratulated by various people, including the king of Sodom. But suddenly, a man now appears on the scene. This man did not fight in the battle and seems totally unrelated to the events of the day, yet he shows up to meet Abraham. What is his name? His name is Melchizedek. Somebody say Melchizedek. And the Bible says that the Melchizedek, the king of Salem, brought bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. I want us to understand a few things. This is the first mention of a priest in the Bible, and it's going to, it's going to be a prototype of biblical priesthood. The first thing Melchizedek does 
is to bring out bread and wine. Obviously, he's on an errand, on an errand, a divine mission, and he has come well prepared. And this is the first time bread and wine are also mentioned together. Symbolism of the bread and wine which Jesus Christ distributed at the Last Supper. He had brought the bread and wine as refreshment to the soldiers or as a priestly sacrament related to his priestly functions. So you can see that he's functioning as a priest, coming to minister to Abraham and to bless him both, bless him both physically and spiritually. One of the things you should know about Melchizedek is that he's also doubling as the king of Salem and he's also called the priest of the Most High. After presenting the bread and the wine to Abraham, he affirmed that Abraham was a true worshiper of the Most High God who created the heavens and the earth and blessed him. So you find out in the verse, it says that, and he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. This is the only priesthood blessing in Genesis. And by blessing Abraham, Melchizedek establishes his spiritual superiority and authority. And Abraham the patriarch acknowledges Mel Melchizedek as his priest or as his spiritual head. What Melchizedek does is that he brings clarity and explains why Abraham was able to defeat the mightier armies, stating that in verse 20, and blessed be the most high God, which had delivered thy enemies into thy hands. He was emphasizing that the victory for Abraham was a victory from God, so that now Abraham and everyone will know that the victory on all the goods that have been recovered were acquired by God's power and therefore belonged to God. In response to what Melchizedek did, Abraham gave him tithes. And again, this is the first mention of the word tithe as a gift or offering. And it is significant to know that this is the first offering mentioned in the Bible in which the items are not given directly to God, but they are given to a man, a human being. In this case, Melchizedek the priest. Unlike the previous offerings in the Bible, these were, this was not a burnt offering, but giving in a loving and undamaged state to the priest of God. So who is Melchizedek? Malki means king and Zedek means righteousness. He's the king of Salem and he's also the priest of the Most High God. He predates the Levitical priesthood and the nation of Israel. So we find God talking about a priest long before there's a, a tribe of Israel or a nation of Israel and before there's even the Levitical priesthood. It is important to know because most people think that when we speak about priesthood, then we start from the Levitical order. Or when we speak about tithing, it starts from the uh, Moses law. But you can find tithing and the priesthood 450 years before the law. So if anybody tells you that tithing is under the law, he should go back and study his word. So we are talking about Melchizedek who is a king and a priest, a national leader and a spiritual leader that is recognized by God, whom Abraham, the father of our faith, also recognizes and he gives tithe. In presenting the tithe to Melchizedek, Abraham acknowledged the exclusive supremacy of God, whom Melchizedek also worshipped, and of the authority and the validity of the priesthood that he exercised. He acknowledged that the God of Melchizedek was his God, the same God who had continued to reveal himself to Abraham since the beginning of his journey of faith. So the principle is that although there are officers and men who receive the gifts of tithing or offerings, the tithe does not belong to them, but it belongs to God. In one single act, Abraham had paid tribute to both the state, Melchizedek as a king, and also to the Lord by his tithe. So Melchizedek, understand clearly, represents a king of righteousness, he represents somebody with authority, and he represents somebody who is also righteous. He shows us that the one who is standing in that position of a priest exercises authority over a jurisdiction and then morally and morally he has character, he has integrity and he's a righteous person. And it's important for you to understand people who stand in the position of a priest or a pastor. You don't just are not immoral, you are, you are just immoral and you behave anyhow. You are a person of righteousness. 
and whatever you receive must be received with integrity and be used righteously. Melchizedek cannot capriciously squander the tithe to feed his greed. And it is noteworthy that when Abraham gave the tithe to Melchizedek, it was be be before the institution of the Levitical tithe, defined under the law 450 years before the law was given through Moses. Therefore, the precedent for tithing is not from the Levitical system. It is from the Mel Melchizedek order and is the foundation upon which biblical tithing is established. It is far superior to the Levitical order and to the Aaronic order, which was later established under the law. Tithing at this place is an act of honor given willingly in acknowledgement of a superior authority by Abraham, who is the father of our faith. So, against this background of Genesis chapter 14 from verse 18 to 20, we are going to make some foundational deductions that a man of God or somebody on divine assignment is an authority figure and can be identified by the following things. Number one, he's a priest of God with authority and integrity. He's not a novice. He's not somebody who has just appeared on the scene calling himself a man of God. This is somebody who was a king, well known. He was a priest long before Abraham even appeared. He's there, established. The Bible talks about people not being novices. Not anybody who has just started a church calls himself a man of God. It's not a title. And we'll speak about that. His identity as a priest is not in question and he's known for his righteousness and integrity. Number two, his first and foremost duty is to represent God and to point all men to God and to his word. So you find out that Melchizedek talks about God and shows Abraham what he should do and what God is doing for him. He talks about God to Abraham. He never talks about himself. He's not establishing himself as who he is. Abraham had never met him, but the focus was, let's talk about God. The third thing is that he does not impose or demand honor. Abraham recognizes who he is and he honors him willingly. It is not a forced relationship. It's an act of honor and appreciation, acknowledging God in his life. You don't go around imposing yourself, do you, I'm your pastor, I am this, I am this. Listen, you, it is something you do because you see God in his life. Is somebody hearing me? And, and it's important because in these last days, there will be many false prophets and false priests. And you need to be able to clearly understand the parameters under which a genuine man of God operates. And we are looking at the example of Melchizedek, the first priest in the Bible. So who is a man of God? Man of God is a biblical title of respect, acknowledging God in the lives of some religious leaders. In the Bible, the term man of God appears 78 times in 72 verses of the Bible and is applied to about 13 individuals. In our world, through scriptures, we identify men who by an allocation of God's grace stand in a unique office and and, and give them recognition as agents of God's grace into our world. So, in this time, we see people who have been blessed with an allocation of God's grace to stand in a particular office. And we recognize those people in our life. These are not just ordinary believers, but people who are separated and called by God. And let me just show you a few things. They are people separated and called by God, number one, they have the ability to discern the current move of God and to know what is God, God is doing. Number two, through personal, intense personal sacrifice, they are available for God's use. You see, a man of God is, a, is, a, is like a sacrifice, a living sacrifice. His whole life is sacrifice to give, to give, representing God. It's not to take. It's not demanding. 
So his life is, I'm going to sacrifice to give you life. Which is the example of Jesus Christ. Number three. A few common traits which characterize these men of God are personal sacrifice, intense training, and testing. These are processes God takes them through to align them with God's sovereign will. So you'll see personal sacrifice, you'll see a lot of training and discipline, and then testing. Number four, this calling to be a man of God demands flexibility and the ability to switch and adapt, whether in the wilderness or in the palace, irrespective of controversies and life risks involved. So you see what Paul went through, see what Jesus Christ went through, see what the, all the early patriarchs went through. It was a life of sacrifice. It was a life of intense persecution. And the Paul says, I've learned to abound and to abyss. I've been through high water, I've been through hell, I've been through storms. Okay, so it is not just uh, sitting in front and crossing your legs and drinking tea. <laughs> There's a lot of um, um, things you, you go through and you adapt. You're not going to go around complaining and, and, and always talking about what you're going through because that is part of the, of, the, of, the, of the uniform we wear. We die daily. We are persecuted. Number five. The Bible exhorts all of us to have and show great respect for these persons and to esteem and honor them highly. So when you find somebody on a divine assignment who is a man of God, God wants you to have a certain relationship with him. And it is interesting that I've read from John chapter 1. He says that he was in the world and the world knew him not. Because the world's idea of a man of God is quite different from the biblical standard. Is somebody hearing me? Okay. So today, we are stirring up the wells in the spirit realm. That there shall be a quickening and an outpour of life as we encounter the men of God in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's look at a few examples of men of God in the Bible. The scripture talks about Moses, Samuel, David, Elijah, Elisha, Paul, Timothy, etc. And let me just give you a few scripture verses. Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 1. It talks about Moses. Now this is the blessing with which Moses, the man of God. So you can see the title, the man of God. Somebody say man of God. Okay, it says he blessed the sons of Israel before his death. Then we can speak about David in Nehemiah chapter 12, verse 36. And he talks about in his kinsmen, Shemaiah, Azarel, Meliah, uh, Galilea, Maya, Nathaniel, Judah, and Hanani with the musical instru instruments of David, the man of God. The man, David is also called the man of God. In the book of 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 18, we can speak about Elijah. So she said to Elijah, what do I have to do with you, O man of God? So you can see the title being used by Moses, by David, by Elijah, and we can go on and on and on and talk about all these people as men of God. But what are the characteristics of all these people? And I'm just going to take you through a few of them. Number one, as we look at the lifestyle of all these people that the Bible refers to and attaches the word man of God, there are a few things we can discern. Number one is that they all have an intimate, personal relationship with God. All of them have had a personal encounter and intimate knowledge and experiences with God. All of them. Some way, somehow, God reveals himself to them personally. He, he gives them a, a personal experience and, and they, they come to know him in an intimate way. Number two, all the men of God are people totally devoted to God and separated from the world. And they are committed to declaring that there is only one God. All the people we have spoken about, they are totally committed to God, separated from the world. And their mandate is clear to declare that there is only one God. Number three, they know the ways of God. 
and they speak the mind of God in any given situation as oracles. They are the mouthpieces of God. They speak. Number four, they deliver very bold and fearless messages, sometimes of condemnation and judgment to the world and to the people and to their kings, warning them to turn from sin. Men of God are often unpopular and not liked in their generation. Somebody hear me? Very bold to speak and confront sin, whether on the national platform, warning people to turn from their sins. Number five, they contend and protect the faith and doctrines of God. And by, and by teaching the people's God's ways, even though they may have been called from an idolatrous background, and that is why one of the things the Bible will tell us in the New Testament is that they labor in the doctrine and in the teaching of the word. Because when people are confused about subjects like lesbianism and about things, they are standing spread. They, they won't look, they are, they are custodians of God's word. They won't even deliver it, they will tell you the truth. So there are some things we don't even argue about. You take it or you leave it. Lesbianism is not of God, period. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 11, it says, But as for you, O man of God, flee these things, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. So we'll talk about this later. And in 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 6, But he said unto him, Behold, there is a man of God in this city, and is a man who is held in honor. All that he says comes true. So now let us go there. Perhaps he can tell us the way we should go. So one of the things about a man of God is that he's known and he's held in honor. Listen carefully. I didn't say you would like him, but you will respect him. You may not like him, but you know that this guy, he will do the right thing. Huh? Is somebody hear me? So I'm not talking about you liking him or clapping for him or being his friend, but he's held in honor because he's known that this guy will stand for what is right and do the right thing. So there are men on divine assignment. They are not looking for human acclamation and applause. These are people who are sold out to God and his purposes. And they are not just a title that he bestowed on them, but their, their lifestyle is being described. They live for God. They are committed to God. They are sold out to God. Sadly, there are few men and women of God in the church. Those who are truly owned, identified, and speaking for God. In general, the church is often full of immature people and typically reflect the world more than God. And so, you find out that in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul is talking about a lot of people and he's exhorting people to rise beyond the pettiness of self in, and focus on weightier matters of destiny. And he says that in fact, you are still carnal and you are still not ready for the move of God because you are still influenced by the flesh. You still have jealousy, you still have dissensions, you, are not, you, are, you, you behave like people who are not born again and he calls them worldly people. So even though they are in church, they are very worldly and unregenerate. So it is important that you understand that a man of God has grown beyond these things this pettiness of the flesh and he's, he's chastising them and saying that instead of feasting on the word of God and you can you still haven't grown and you can still only handle milk instead of being pacemakers you are still known as someone who quarrels a lot so it is important for you to understand that when you say somebody is a man of God he has in many cases outgrown this canal disaster of fighting, of, of pettiness, of jealousies. And, and, and his, his boast is not in dresses or cars or houses, but in his ability to contend for the faith. I'm going to read a verse of scripture in Jude chapter 1. And I want all of us to read it. Jude chapter 1 verse 3. This is Paul talking to Jude. And he says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you 
that you earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints you do what you earnestly contend for the faith there must be a contention look today our, when we're young if you went to high school it was likely that having education will draw you closer to God isn't it that the more learned you became the more aware you became of God today it's not like that you go into school and you are inundated with a lot of rubbish information about sexuality about lesbianism and people are being forced to learn that and so Paul is saying that listen contend for the faith let the faith stand don't let it go men of God contend for the faith one of the principal things we declare there is only one God there will be arguments and all theories but we will stand and declare our God is God and you find that in, in, in Elijah and Elisha people who, who actually battled for the supremacy of God in 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 20 it says O Timothy keep that which is committed to thy trust avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of signs falsely so called where signs is coming and trying to disprove some things it, Timothy look get these things out of the way no signs no scientific theory can disprove our God and there must be doctors there must be lawyers there must be um, Christian statements who rise up and debunk all these scientific theories that is trying to disprove there is no God the history of the church consists of repeated battles where the enemy is introducing destructive heresies and those heresies must be confronted and the truth clarified and proclaimed and this is what Paul himself is doing in first Timothy many other New Testament letters have the same polemic thrust the great church councils and creeds while they may not carry spiritual authority were attempts to correct false teachings and to set forth sound doctrines when we talk about the reformation it consisted of godly men like luther and calvin combating the corruption and false doctrines that have permitted permeated the early roman catholic church setting forth the great truths of scripture we must tear down arguments and every arrogant obstacle that is raised against the knowledge of god and take into captivity every thought and bring it to the obedience of Christ. Is somebody hearing me? So, what am I showing you? When you see somebody who is a man of God, it's not somebody who is just by, you don't identify him by his dressing and by the car he drives and by the number of bodyguards around. It's much bigger than that. Those are worldly standards. Is somebody hear me? Somebody who can contend for the faith. And that's why if you want to be a man of God, one of your major tools must be authority of the scriptures. You are well grounded. You are well researched. You know your theology well. So if you have Christians who today don't study the word, you have pastors who don't know the scriptures, who all they can say is prophecy and prophesy, you can see that we have a major problem. Because it's not prophesying that makes you a man of God. It is being able to contend for the faith against governments. So let's read First Timothy chapter six, from verse eleven to fourteen, and looks and look at a few things about the characteristics of men of God. It says, "But thou, O man of God, mm, flee these things." and follow so the first thing is there are things you must flee run away from and in particular if you read the verses preceding this it is talking about the lust of money so when you find a man of god listen he's not he's not after filthy looker he's not in ministry because he's looking for money money is something is a god is the, the god of mammon has been properly subdued you cannot influence him with money So if you ever think that, oh, because you give him money, he'll do this. Or because you go and give him a seed offering, he'll do this and he's become your friend. No, 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 no. And he's not going to be asking, asking. When Melchizedek came, he didn't ask for money. So one of the things that will differentiate in these end times, 
men of God from false prophets. It's this issue of money. Is somebody hearing me? I know today there are a lot of people who are taking full-time ministry as a job. But I'll tell you something. It's beyond that. It's beyond that. It says, man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. You see the description of the character and the things a man of God pursues. He's pursuing righteousness. It means that he's going to follow and insist on right things being done. He's pursuing godliness. He's following after faith. He's following after love, after patience, after meekness. And verse 12, it says, fight the good fight of faith. So he's involved in a fight where he's fighting and contending for the faith. That the doctrines, that the scriptural interpretations, that the soundness of his teachings, very solid. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. Whereunto thou art called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. Verse 13. I give thee charge in the sight of God, who quickeneth all things and before Jesus Christ, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good for confession. So you find out that Jesus Christ stood before Pontius Pilate. He stood before an authority figure in the world, but he didn't change the scripture. So the kings will come up against you. Authority figures may come up against you, but you don't change the scripture. You still witness a good confession. How many people will look for a lobby government and immediately change things? See, a, a true man of God will speak the truth of the word and speak as an oracle of God because his first representation, I represent Christ. I don't represent a political party. So, Paul is giving four commands to Timothy, the man of God, with a motivation to fulfill this. And so let's look at some of the things. Number one, a man of God will flee sin and especially the love of money. Men of women of God are known by what they flee, what they move away from, and what they pursue. Number two, the man of God will pursue godly character. Instead, pursue righteousness. Cell leaders, department leaders, Pursue godliness. Grow up to become men of God. Pursue faithfulness. Pursue love. Pursue endurance. Pursue gentleness and meekness. Not only is the man of God known by what he flees, but by what he pursues. And this implies that godly character doesn't appear overnight. It's not a gift. So there's a difference between the charismatic gift and the character. Because the gift can be demonic. But the character reflects God. Is somebody here with me? Is somebody here with me tonight? Okay. So, number three. Fight the good fight of faith. Grow in doctrine. There's always a pain or agony that comes with fighting. However, this fight is good. Get yourselves immersed in the study of the word. In prayer. In all, all night. In fastings. Fight it. You want to be a man of God? You want to be somebody totally sold out, representing God? You've got to learn how to give yourself. Fight your flesh. Fight the world. Fight the demonic forces. And put yourself into a study of the word. Without this fight, the souls of men will be lost. So, every time the devil wants to gain victory, he plants lies. He attacks the doctrines of scripture. And he does this because he realized that if he can fight the truth, if he can twist it, it will lead to loss or destruction. So one of the major tools of a man of God is to be established in the truth and stand for the truth and speak the truth. Why are so many people confused about offerings and tithing and all those things? Because the devil has planted lies. Why do people now feel that, oh, now serving God is, is a waste of time? Because there's a lie. Somebody's propagating those lies. But the man of God will still teach the truth against the popular grain of society. He will still be teaching the doctrines of truth. God gives us, may God give us men who will teach and labor in doctrine to keep us in truth and out of error. And so for this reason, Timothy should guard and fight for the truth even as Paul did. Okay. 
it is impossible to be a true soldier of Jesus Christ and not be a fighter of truth. Once you're a soldier of Jesus Christ, you are going to have to fight. And you are going to be fighting a lot of things, including falsehood, including lies, including wrong doctrines. Okay? So when you are counseling or ministering to people, one must identify the lies that a person believes and use the truth of God's word to save the person. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, it says, verse 4 and 5, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. We tear down arguments and arrogant obstacles that has been raised against the knowledge of God. Though fighting is difficult and undesired, we must fight to the end. And at the end of it, we will say, I have fought a good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Hello? So, we have seen Paul just contrasting false teachers and doctrines and men of this world and people who are real men of God. And he says that the man of God flees from sin. The man of God pursues godly character. And the man of God contends for the faith. So, as we grow as Christians and children in the house of God, judge and measure your progress by these things. What you are fleeing, what you are pursuing, and what you are contending for. Should I say it again? What you are fleeing, what you are pursuing, what you are contending for. I'm contending for the faith. I'm fleeing sin and I'm pursuing God. Somebody with me? We're, we're not going into the world. We're not chasing after the world. We're not chasing after money. No. So against this background, you will now understand how you come to a church and you are going to meet somebody who may stand in the office of a man of God. Are you with him? Are you with me? Okay, so that you can, when you walk into a, not, look, not every building in these last days is a church. You know what the devil has realized? When they were, when they were serving idols, they had shrines. But they realized that with education, people have noticed that shrines are for demonic evil people. So many of the people who are in the shrines have metamorphosized into churches and put up a building and call it a church. But the spirit is wrong. So not every building you enter into that is called a church. It's a church. Should I say that again? Sometime back, if you saw a juju man, he had painted one eye white. He wasn't well dressed. He lived in a bush and had a shrine. So everybody could say, this is demonic. Today, they're not like that. Though. The Bible says that they have become like wolves in sheep's clothing. So they have learned to change their outward to make it look like they're not wolves, but they are wolves. And you'll find out that this thing I've talked about, about what you flee, they haven't fled it. This thing I've talked about, what you pursue, that's not what they are pursuing. This third thing I've talked about, contending for the faith, their doctrine is bad. So, one of the things we have discovered is that many of them have metamorphosized into evangelists and into churches because they realize that they will be able to deceive people and attract more educated people. And that's why you must be careful in these last days. Is somebody hearing me? Because many of you, some people are calling you and talking to you and prophesying over your life who should not have a right. But if you open the door and you give them access, Don't blame God. I'm teaching these things because you need to have an understanding of the terrain and the environment in which you are operating so that you are not naive. The Bible says that do not be ignorant of the devil's devices. And that no matter, what, once you find a good church, I've shown you a man of God is not a novice. He, Melchizedek had a long-standing reputation 
He didn't just appear and start working miracles and, and performing things to attract attention to himself. No. One of the major signs of a man of God is his ability to contend for the faith and establish doctrine. And so you'll find in First Timothy where the Paul talks, exhorts people and says that those who labor, we admonish you that those who labor in doctrine and in the word, honor them. Isn't it amazing that today's church, many people don't like doctrine and the word. That many people are rather following after signs and wonders. The, the magicians of Egypt. So that when we call for a cell meeting, so that when we call for a Tuesday evening service, so that when we call for a meeting that is going to teach the word, where you hold the Bible and you sit down and do a Bible study, according to 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 15, study. How many of you are there? But you want to go to a church where on a Sunday morning, and then you fall down, and then you are screaming. It doesn't change your character. It gives you an experience, but it doesn't change your character. It doesn't form God within you. Because after the miracle, you must still come back to fleeing sin, to pursuing God, and to contending for the faith. How do you describe men of God today? Tell you that man of God is powerful. Listen, we are not powerful. We serve a powerful God. Who works through us by his grace. So that man of God is powerful. When you go, he will obey my he will tell you things. Listen, listen, listen. You see, you are, you are following from the wrong end. If God's grace chooses to work through us, confirming his word with signs and wonders, we give him all the glory. A church is not about activities and, 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 and conferences, bringing in people just to attract people and to grow. Listen, the focus must be on the word. And I want to talk to you because if you don't like the word, and if you don't follow after the word, you will follow after a substitute, which is not God. Should I, can you understand what I'm saying to you? So when I start talking about men on divine assignment, I believe that by God's design, it is to deliver us. Is somebody with me? So you walk into a church, you look at the person who's standing as the pastor. What is he fleeing? What is he pursuing? Is he contending for the faith? So let me just give you a little background on how you are going to relate with authority figures you meet in the church. Because it will, to a large extent, determine your relationship with God. God has chosen and prepared some people to look after his church. It is God who, by his sovereign will, chooses and sets these people in the church, in his church. And now that you are a member of a local church, it is important you learn how to relate with these people so you can also develop your relationship with God. Israel as a nation, on many occasions, could not discern and accept the people God sent to them and always treated them so badly in carrying God's pleasure on many occasions. Turn your Bible to Matthew chapter 22. 23, verse 37. Matthew chapter 23, verse 37. One, two, go. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, or O powerhouse, powerhouse. O Choco, Choco. O Ghana, Ghana. Okay, let's go ahead. Thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee. Stop there. So what was, the, what was the, uh, uh, the, the lifestyle of that generation? They kill prophets. So when God sends somebody, they don't like the person. Because the person is doing things they, that, that doesn't allow them to be comfortable. They don't want to flee sin. They don't want to pursue God. So they kill prophets. Number two, they stone them which are sent. 
What a generation. They come to church with stones. We are waiting to stone that guy. And then whatever. He says, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathered her chickens under her wings to protect you, and you did not allow me. So God says, I sent you prophets, I sent you people to come and protect you, to gather you together so that you'll be protected, and you didn't allow me to do it. Would you reject what God sends into your life? Would you allow God to work into your life? You know, sometimes, and, and in this gen generation, unfortunately, a lot of people have to be corrected and rebuked for so many reasons. And sometimes, the reaction is painful because you can see God wants to help you by rebuking you or by correcting you or by showing you the right thing. But they, they won't allow you. Eh, why, why should a pastor talk to me that way? Why, why? And then immediately, they leave. Can God work in your life? Can God talk to you today to change your habits and your ways? Can God ask you to be more serious and pursue after him and come for Bible study and read your Bible and fast and pray and fellowship and worship him? Or you are set in your mind, you are pursuing things of the world. So sometimes a little money in the hands of people little wealth in spite of all their religious practices and feasts the Israelites consistently miss God and his visitation in our generation we cannot afford to commit the same mistakes it is very important for us to locate and receive the man of God he sends into our lives so we can receive God and allow his power to work in our lives There are some people, your parents may never correct you. There are some people, your political party may never correct you because you are popular. There are some people, nobody can correct you because of your position in society. But John the Baptist will speak to Herod and cost him his neck. Can you be corrected and asked to serve God more fervently? Can you be asked to improve your work? Can you be corrected in your dressing? Can you be corrected in your attitudes? Can you be talked to? And sometimes, unfortunately, the worst people to try to correct are pastors. Hmm. Because like they've been immunized. They have a little of it, so... They know more than anybody, so you can't correct them. I want you to look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. We are just about ending in the next five minutes. Like I said, this is just a background for you to be able to understand when I begin to build on it next week. So I'm setting the foundational principles that will give you understanding. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. He says, and he gave some apostles. Who is he talking about? Who is the one who is giving? God. So God himself looks at his people and he decides that you need this. So just like he gave his, his son Jesus Christ, just like he gave the Holy Ghost, then he also realized that, no, I cannot leave you. I must give you some people amongst you on divine assignment to help you. So God in his wisdom has looked at us and says, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Why? So that the saints will be perfected. It means that we are not perfect. But God is bringing these people our way to come and help us become better people. So when God wants to work in your life, he will send human beings. Now this is the irony. And this is where the challenge starts. Because God is going to take an imperfect human being to correct another imperfect human being. <laughs> and that's where the problem starts. Because the person who is telling you to do the right thing himself has problems. But you don't realize that it is God who is working. Can you see? 
Because God is going to take another human being like you, who must also be saved, who also needs the grace of the Lord to perfect another human being. But isn't it the same everywhere? A teacher is teaching you to become better. A doctor, another human being, is working on another human being. So everywhere God works on with human beings to work on other human beings to improve life. But when it comes to ministry and it comes to work, because there's a demonic element, people, demons fight it. And even the pastors are not righteous. Even the pastors are thieves. Even the pastors are like this. I know we are not perfect. But God still gives us to you on a divine assignment to perfect the saints for the work of the ministry and for the edifying of the body of Christ. So if you want to be able to allow God to work in your life, you've got to learn how to relate with human beings but see them differently. Because a Melchizedek has come but Abraham, the patriarch, the father of our faith, sees him and recognizes that this is God at work. And all over in the Bible, where God opens people's eyes to begin to see that the, even though these are ordinary human beings, there's a grace allocated over their lives that allows them to stand in a certain office representing God as his mouthpiece to the world. Lives begin to change because God can work. Because God can work. Jeremiah chapter 3 verse 15. Just about ending. Jeremiah chapter 3 verse 15. Let's all read it together. One, two, go. And I will give you pastors according to my heart. What will be their main preoccupation? They shall feed you with what? Knowledge and understanding. They shall do what? Feed you. They shall do what? Feed you. So you find again the contending for doctrine and the word. So when God sends somebody in your way, the major thing he's come to do is to feed you. Huh? Signs and wonders and things are, are, are an accompaniment thing. But the essence of it is that he will feed you with knowledge and with understanding. So you want to see a man of God listen to his doctrine. Listen to what he teaches. Knowledge, doctrine, understanding. So if you want God to work in your life, one of the things you are going to have to follow after is knowledge and understanding knowledge and understanding i came to church i've come to get knowledge and understanding it means that there will be enlightenment darkness will go out of my head and out of my mind and a certain knowledge will be infused into me that will allow me to stand strong for lack of knowledge my people perish but i refuse to perish because god is giving me his knowledge and the knowledge of the truth sets me free If you have an idea what it takes to get into the throne room of grace and without any Bible school teaching, to be able to receive from God and to be able to stand and say that this is God's word, sometimes it's frightening. But God still does it. That is the place you should be in these end times. That is how God is working in you. And a man who's pursuing godliness. And a man who's pursuing faith. A man who's pursuing meekness and love. Not arrogance and boasting and show of cars and houses and where I've traveled and who I've met. No, 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 no. Those things come because of the calling. God will put us in corridors of power. But that is not the mainstay of our ministry. What we flee, what we pursue, and what we contend for. Hello? So it is important that you understand that there are men on divine assignment into your life. God is sending people to help you. I know you've been praying a lot. 
But God has sent Jesus Christ. He was in the world. They didn't know him. Today in your life, today in Choco, may you not miss the visitation of God. May you not be blinded like the Israelites were blinded. And whatever God is doing, you can't see it. He was in the world and the world was made by him. And he sent his son into the world. And the world knew him not. But then he says in verse 12, but as many as received him. So there were some people who saw it and they received him. There were some people who knew it and rejected him. But others saw it and received it. And he said that to those people, God began to work out his purposes and his plans in their lives. I'm not here to be like you. I want to say to all of you clearly. I'm not here to play a popularity tune. This is not a political election. I stand here first as a mouthpiece of God. Some of the things I do you may not like. But always remember. And judge it fairly. Because some of you I may rebuke. Some of you I may correct. Some of you I may instruct. Some of you I may teach. And some of the rebuke, especially rebuke and corrections, is not easy. But sometimes it has to be done. And see that God is trying to remove things from your life so he can take you to the next level and make you better. So if you are somebody who gets easily angry and offended, you will miss out on God's move. Especially as you grow. I have realized by experience that as people grow, it's more difficult to rebuke and correct them, so leave them. But I also know that we need the instructions of God. And I pray, may God open our eyes and give us discernment. That whoever he sends into our lives and into our way, may we receive him. Because it's only by receiving these men of God, that God himself who points us to the right way. In fact, John the Baptist says that I may decrease and that he may increase. That I, I, the, more, the more I stay in him, the more I'll, I'll decrease and the more you see him. I, I don't want to take the place of Jesus Christ. No, 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 no. I can't. And I don't want to be so puffed up. Hello? And so today, I pray that may God open our eyes that we may discern and receive the people he sends because God is still sending people into our lives. Like I said, this is just the foundation. But I can end by showing you a story of somebody who died and went to hell. And in hell, he said, send somebody from heaven to go and talk to them. And God said, ah, 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 ah. They still have Abraham and the prophets. If they don't listen to them, even if I send an angel, they don't listen. So it means that God is still has his people on this earth who are talking to us. And I want to bring you into a closer relationship with God. I want you to come to church and feel that I am in the presence of God. I want to know him more. I yearn for more of him. I want to follow after God. I want to be passionate with God. And as I stay longer, may I become better. The sad part is to have pastors who misbehave. Or people who have been in church and the longer they stay in church, the more recalcitrant. Now they come late. I don't want to go into that now. But humble yourself and let God exalt us. And if you come here, whatever you do in this church, listen to me carefully. Humble yourselves and pursue after God. There's no other reason why you should be here. And no matter what you do, we can dispense with you. No matter what you do, if you are not there, it will be done. And God will build his church. Should I say it again? No matter what you do, including me, if I arrange chess, and I think that's all that there is to serving God, let's follow after God. Let's follow after God in his house. And let's love him with all our hearts, with all our souls, and with all our minds. Rise on your feet, everybody. Thank you.